of 20 and 60 to come three times a year to uh, the place of sacrifice, which was the temple there in Jerusalem. And since Jesus in his earthly walk fulfilled the law in every degree, he faithfully came these three times. That is, in the spring of the year, just before the harvest began, and then uh, in the uh, late in the spring or early summer as the harvest was finished. That's the harvest of the grain crops. And then uh, late in the fall of the year after the uh, fruit olives and so forth have been harvested and uh, we have a setting here in the gospel of John which extends from the 7th chapter on into the 11th chapter Uh, this all took place when Jesus came to Jerusalem to attend the feast of tabernacles which was the last festivity of the uh, Jewish year and uh, which occurred approximately six months before he was crucified. And at this time, he had been thoroughly rejected by the Jewish leaders, and he had become somewhat of a controversial figure, as well as the populace was concerned, some of them believing their leaders and some of them believing in his miracles. And so we often see the phraseology that they were divided. Some believed and some uh, said he was uh, the son of God and others says, uh, said that his motivation was of Satan. And of course, at this period of time, the Jewish leaders uh, were trying to uh, alienate the people from Christ. They realized that uh, uh, he was making quite an impact. And uh, one of the things that motivated them, as we'll see later, was that they actually feared that... Uh, he would have so many followers that the Roman authorities would uh, intervene and uh, they would lose their uh, their position and so forth. We'll be told that as we get into the 12th chapter. Of course, they also uh, were moved by their own sins of pride and envy and so forth. But um, we've been, we progressed about halfway through this controversy uh, that happened there in Jerusalem. And we're now in the 8th chapter, and uh, we read, as you'll remember, the last time we were together, verse 32, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, We are Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Well, their appraisal of their situation in the first place is not exactly correct. As a nation, uh, they had been in captivity more than once. They were slaves for some four generations or more in Egypt, and uh, God had to release them from that bondage. And then uh, they were captives of the uh, uh, Babylonians for 70 years, and now they're uh, conquered by the Roman nation. I suppose what they mean is that uh, they are uh, they were freeborn. That is to say, they weren't uh, personal slaves of anyone, but uh, they were slaves. And of course, what Jesus is referring to is their slavery to sin. They say. Uh, they say. Uh, we've never been in bondage to any man but his answer in verse 34 verily verily I say unto you whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin he points out to them that every human being that uh, has not been freed by the power of God uh, from his sinful condition is a slave to that sin now this is a, a teaching of both the old and the New Testament. For instance, if you want to look for a moment in back in Proverbs, the fifth proverb. You see there in uh, Proverbs 5 and verse 22. His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with cords of his sins. 
uh, sin binds with a cord. Now, we see this uh, most graphically, of course, in sins like drug addiction or those who uh, uh, can't overcome the gambling instinct or an uh, individual that's slave to a sexual drive. Or uh, in that uh, category, we can fully recognize that people are under bondage. But uh, some people are under bondage uh, to their uh, temperament uh, or to just what would normally con- be considered uh, rather harmless habits. Uh, we just have to have certain things in order to get along with it. Uh, I heard someone say years and years ago, and it made an effect on me, we are possessed by our possessions. I was recently uh, talking with somebody about a very wealthy man uh, who lived in my town, and he was a big game hunter. And uh, he always had his animals stuffed until he had polar bears and great Alaskan brown bears and all of these great animals from Africa and so forth. And he had dozens and dozens of them. But, you know, pretty soon, what do you do with them? Uh, They got to be careful. And he actually rented a store building in the center of Lakeland. And for years, uh, had uh, had it available there for school children to go in and see and so forth. But pretty soon, you know, everybody saw them. And it, uh, it was really a worrisome thing to him. And this same man had a had a mansion up on Bearwalla Mountain, uh, which is uh, near Hendersonville, North Carolina. And uh, every time he'd come to Florida, of course, everybody up there knew it, and his uh, place would be raided and all of the stuff inside taken away. And uh, he would uh, frequently get calls from the authorities up there, you better come up, your place has been uh, ransacked and such as that. And that went on, you know, for a number of years. Uh, I know someone that lives fairly close to there, and I just asked them three or four weeks ago, uh, whatever happened to that home? They says, well, he finally abandoned it because he just, it just worried him so much. He got a heart attack worrying about it, and he just abandoned it. And it was a place that would, I suppose, today sell for two, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000. And uh, uh, a person can be slaved, uh, enslaved just to his possessions. You know, I really feel sorry for these people that have a, and I know some, they have a a cottage on the lake, and they have one down by the seashore, and they have another one up in the mountains, and uh, when it gets the first freeze, they got to go and tend to the water up there, and you know, they're really uh, enslaved to their possessions. Some people are enslaved by their hobbies uh, or, or whatever, but the worst slavery is a slavery uh, that uh, that has us all, and that's the slavery uh, to sin. Now, Paul does quite a dissertation on this in the sixth chapter of Romans, if you might remember. In Romans chapter 6, verse 16, Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey... His servants you are, whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that whereas you were servants of sin, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which is delivered to you, being then made free from sin. You became the servants of righteousness. And then he uh, points out how much better this is. I speak after the manner of men, or I am speaking in human terms, because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as you have received your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity even so yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness and when you were the servants of sin you were free from righteousness what fruit had ye then in those things of which you are now ashamed for the end of those things is death now being made free from sin and become servants to God ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then he goes in the seventh chapter about this struggle between our old bondage and uh, being uh, uh, bonded to Christ. So look at the end of, of chapter 7, verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me 
from the body of this death. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law, but the flesh, the law of sin. What he's saying is that in this matter of sin and righteousness, there is no neutral ground. You're even either a, a slave, so to speak, to righteousness or a slave to sin. That is, uh, you're captivated by the, uh, the desire to please God and do right or else sin will captivate you, one or the other. So you've got to go one way or the other, so take your choice. And uh, then, of course, in the eighth chapter of, uh, of Romans, he goes on to explain how if we will permit ourselves to be slaves under righteousness, then it becomes a joy. And uh, it's, a, it's a happy bondage, a, a glorious bondage, we might say. But, uh, see, these men didn't understand that they were slaves. They thought they were free men, uh, but... Uh, not only were they, un they under bondage to the Roman government, but they were under bondage to sin because only the Son can set you, see back, uh, set you free. Back in John chapter 8 again, verse 35, And the servant abides not in the house forever, but the Son abides forever. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. He says, Don't you understand... If you're a servant, uh, it's never a permanent thing. Uh, the servant can be dismissed when he wants to. Uh, he's, he's not his own boss, but Christ is a son, and whatever he is, he'll be forever. So if you yield yourself to him, well then, it's a forever relationship. And he says, if the son therefore shall set you free, ye shall be free indeed. Now, in what ways does Christ set us free? Well, he sets us free uh, from sin in three different aspects. He sets us free from the penalty of sin. Remember, we read in, in Romans chapter 6, the wages of sin is death. Well, he sets us free from that penalty. That's what he came to earth to do. When he came and lived a perfect life for us, fulfilled the law in all of its aspects for us, and then died on Calvary's cross, conquered death by uh, rising from the dead. Uh, through that, he freed us from the penalty of sin. For if we believe in our heart that uh, he has risen from the dead, then we're saved, you see, and we're, we're freed from that bondage. The wages of sin is death. That's the penalty. So Christ first frees us from the penalty of sin. That's in his past ministry. But Jesus Christ has a ministry today. And he has a ministry towards us after we have been freed from the penalty of sin. And that ministry is to free us uh, from the, the uh, power of sin day to day. There are some Christians, some people who have been freed from the penalty of sin. That is, they have recognized that... Uh, that they were lost sinners and they called upon a, a merciful God for his salvation and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and they have received his salvation but they're still under bondage to sin. I was talking with a man not long ago. He said, I know I'm saved but why can't I shake this habit I've got? I loathe it. Uh, he's, he's still under bondage, isn't he? And so... Uh, he needs to understand that Jesus Christ has a ministry today. See, I noticed when this man talked, he always used the past tense when he talked to, uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was When he thought of Christ, he was thinking about something that Jesus Christ did historically. And he appreciated that. And Christ did do something historically. And we should appreciate what he did historically. But he is doing something presently. And that which he is doing presently in our lives, he's saving us from the power of sin day to day. Past tense from the penalty of sin, present tense from the power of sin. But salvation also has a future tense. And this same one, because he'll be a son forever, he can save us and will save us from the very presence of sin someday. From the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and from the very presence of sin. Now, if you'll stop and think about it, 
as far as saving us from the penalty of sin, that is a one-time accomplished fact. Yes, God, I'm a sinner. Save me. He saves me. And forever, without any effort on my part, forevermore, I'm saved from the penalty of sin. And just as sure as I have been saved from the penalty of sin, I shall be saved from the very presence of sin without doing anything just because I have received Christ as my Savior. But now when we get to the this matter of salvation from the power of sin on a day-to-day basis, that's an opportunity for us to develop our faith. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So I need to saturate myself in His Word if I want the faith to be saved day by day from the power of sin. But if the Son shall set you free, shall really set you free, you'll be free indeed. Free from the penalty of sin, free from the power of sin, and free someday from the very presence of sin. So it's a, it's a uh, great and complete freedom. And of course, these ears that were listening to him had no comprehension of this. In verse 37 of chapter 8, I know that you are Abraham's seed. He says, I know you're descendants of Abraham. But you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father and you do that which you have seen with your father. And they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you'd do the works of Abraham. And he's going to, uh, he's going to draw that line later on. They answered and said unto him, Abraham, is our father. Jesus said unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you'd do the works of Abraham, but now you seek to kill me. A man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, and this did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said unto him, we're not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Now, you know, Christ was accused of a, not having a valid father. And uh, uh, this is one of the the burdens he bore, one of the shames he bore, and one of the shames that his mother bore. Uh, uh, Those around that had no uh, discernment of spiritual things, they didn't have the power to understand conception by the Holy Spirit. All they knew was that Mary got pregnant before she got married. And uh, this uh, put her in a in a rather bad way, but of course her conscience was clear. She knew that the power of God had come upon her and caused her uh, to bring forth this birth. But uh, Christ, among those, carried this stigma. Uh, the uh, he's later on they're going to call him a Samaritan, and of course this was uh, one of their accusations against the Samaritans that they didn't uh, regard the marital laws of God and. Uh, they uh, formed families as they chose. You remember uh, the Samaritan woman which uh, Christ accosted in the uh, fourth chapter. Uh, he said, uh, you've said of a truth that you have no fa- uh, a husband. You have had five husbands and the one that you now have is not your husband. And uh, this is uh, what they were noted for and so that's why they call him a Samaritan, uh, that he was not uh, uh, valid. And so it's a rather a slur. We are not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you'd love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. If you would uh, draw a circle around every time the word sent is used in this discourse, you'd, uh, you'd see whatever else Jesus claimed to be, he claimed to be the sent one. It's one of the most used words from his own lips. In, uh, in the book of John. You'll find it very prevalent in this particular section or all the way on through, uh, as a matter of fact. He is, that was his claim, that he was sent from the heavens above. We needed someone that was sent from above. You remember in the typology of the, uh, of the tabernacle in the wilderness, there was only one door into the presence of God. And it, it had four colors. It was blue, uh, and it was scarlet, and it was purple, and it was white. 
And it needed to be all of those things because in that respect, it represents Jesus Christ, the doorway. I am the door. We'll get into this a little more. But it, it, that door was uh, blue. See, the, the wall all the way around the tabernacle was white, but the doorway had four colors. It had to be blue to represent that he was from the heavens. We needed someone from the heavens. We needed a sent one. We needed somebody sent from where death isn't. Because this is a death world. We needed a heavenly one. And then we needed one who could offer a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That's the scarlet. And we needed one who was a king. That's the, the purple. Because this world already has a king. And uh, Jesus referred to this when he says that you can't enter a strong man's house unless a stronger than the strong man come and first bind him. And of course the application is that Satan is the strong man that controls this house and Christ came as a stronger than the strong man to bind him. We'll get into that also in the, the twelfth chapter in the twelfth chapter. But uh, he is the sent one. He says uh, in verse forty three why do you not understand my speech even because you cannot hear my words? You are of your father the devil. Um, three times in the Bible, in the New Testament, certain ones are called the children of the devil. We might look at the other two instances so we can see just who is it that's called the uh, children of the devil. Jesus Christ here was speaking specifically to those who were opposing him, uh, those who were trying to uh, steer the people away from him. Uh, you find this used by the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 13, where he's speaking there of a Jewish religious leader who was trying to pervert Paul, the message of Paul and Barnabas as they were witnessing to this Roman government official. See, uh, let's read up that uh, we're in Acts chapter 13, verse 6. And when they had gone through the isle and the Papus, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. That I means son of Jesus who was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word. But Elamus, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, set his eyes upon him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief thou child of the devil thou enemy of righteousness wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord in other words he uh, Paul when he calls someone a child of the devil he is speaking to someone who's professing to be a prophet of God but uh, he is perverting the right way now in uh, in 1 John, the epistle of 1 John, chapter 3. Verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteous is not of God, neither uh, he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and killed his brother. And why killed he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Now, probably if you considered the context carefully, uh, here again in First John, it would be those that would pervert the way. I don't know if the Bible means to include every unsaved, every unsaved person in the uh, blanket condemnation, you are of your father, the devil. He is speaking specifically to those 
who pervert the way of God. That's Satan's occupation, to pervert the way of God, uh, to turn people from believing that God is good. That was his activity with Adam and Eve. He said, to Eve, hath God said, uh, placing doubt in her mind about God's veracity, and says, God doth know that if you eat of this fruit, you'll be as God. In other words, he's saying, Eve, God has an ulterior motive in not wanting you to eat of this fruit. And so he was perverting God's goodness. And uh, that's what Satan does. And a human being that perverts God's goodness is called a child of the devil. Now, I know it's it's uh, quite common to, to call everybody a child of the devil that is not a child of God. But I'm not sure that the, the particular phrase is used in that context, but uh, probably more specifically refers to those who would pervert God's way. So, verse 44 again, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own for he's a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God hears God's word. Ye therefore hear them not because you're not of God. He's a... He's rather point blank there, isn't he? Uh, you know, even in uh, fundamental Christian circles, you hear very little of that point blank talk. Uh, we're trained now to couch everything in a nice language, even uh, those that uh, oppose us. It's uh, just considered not gentlemanly to talk as Christ was talking here. And uh, you ruffle feathers. Uh, if you've got to uh, say something, say it in a nice way. Don't say, ye are your father the devil. That's not nice at all to say things like that. No. But uh, that's the way he said it. And uh, I suppose we we need more spokesmen with the discernment to be able to say, uh, the Apostle Peter says, speak as of the oracles of God. In other words, find out how God says it and don't speak for God unless you can say it like God says it. Step down. Stop talking. Unless uh, it will be recognized that what you're saying is what God says. Then you can speak. And uh, there's all little, all too little of uh, God's spokesmen today who speak as of the oracles of God. It's, uh, uh, we, we seem to put a little apologetical note after we say. Uh, we'll say something that the Bible says and then says, of course, everybody doesn't look at it that way. You know, or we'll say it just like the Bible is. Uh, we we'll say, of course, there are differences of opinion on that. You know, soften the blow a little. Well, when you're saying exactly what God says and you're saying, you're speaking God's word, the human ears, you're supposed to speak it forth as the oracles of God. And uh, it's to come forth in force. Um, in uh, the church, in a particular church, the people don't have a pastor right now. And they've had, uh, the last couple have been just terrific Christians, you know. And you know, they, they, they everybody would recognize them as very, uh, godly people in the walk. And you know, everybody when you got through, you feel so good going out of the church and the old preacher, what, I had sure that was a great sermon, made us feel so good today. And, uh, that type of thing. But, uh, after when the when the change come out, somebody got up in the pulpit and says, "What this church needs is an exhorter." Well, 
you know, God calls out certain saints to be exhorters. Uh, now, primarily, I'm not an exhorter. Uh, as best I know, if uh, my friends apprise my gift right, it's more a gift of teaching. But I get off base sometime, they claim, and do a little exhorting. And uh, I suppose it's all right. Uh, but you see, a teacher is someone who simply opens up the word to show you what it says. Opens up the meaning of it. But an exhorter propels God's word in the force of the Spirit of God in such a manner that the hearer is moved into action. There's a different purpose. Teaching is to build up knowledge of God. But exhortation is to uh, drive lethargy out by the power of the Word of God so that we'll get to doing what God's doing in the world today. The result of exhortation is doing. The result of teaching is knowing. And that's why God needs exhorters and that's why he needs teachers. And we seem to be short of both kinds. But it seems to me that we're the most short of of real exhorters. And I suppose that's why some of us that might not be particularly gifted towards exhorting uh, get off our uh, to slightly to the side of our center post and uh, and uh, indulge ourselves along those lines to some extent. Anyway. Um, We're in verse 48. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and has a demon? Says, uh, now they knew he wasn't a Samaritan. They knew where he was from. He was a Galilean. As far as where he grew up, that was his manner of speech was as a Galilean because Nazareth, Nazareth was in Galilee. And that was the other side of Samaria. But uh, they're calling calling him a Samaritan by way of derision. Verse 49, Jesus answered, I have not a demon, but I honor my father. And you do dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judges. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Well, verse 52, Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, If a man keep my sayings, he shall never taste death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets that are dead? Who do you make yourself to be? Who are you claiming to be? You're claiming to be greater than Abraham? You're claiming to be greater than the prophets? Well, that's what he was claiming. He's going to claim it very specifically in just a little while. Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honors me, of whom you say that he is your God, but you have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, then I shall be a liar like you. But I know him, and I keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now, many times we, we have the question, what to what extent did the Old Testament saints understand God's true way of salvation when they offered up those animals? Uh, did, uh, did they understand the significance? Uh, yes, the Bible says they did. The same Holy Spirit taught them. You know, there's a misconception that the Holy Spirit began his ministry on earth at the day of Pentecost. But that's not true. The Holy Spirit has always had a ministry on earth, and he always will have a ministry on earth. 
he always is the one who does God's work on earth operatively, even from the creation. For it was the Spirit of God that moved upon the face of the waters and said, let there be light, and there was light. That's right from the beginning. And the Spirit of God was dealing with men's heart from the very beginning. Don't we read in Genesis chapter 6, the Spirit of God will not always strive with men? The Spirit of God has always been operative. That's not the difference. Now, something happened on the day of Pentecost, and it had to do with the person of the Holy Spirit. But that's not what he when he started operating on earth. <laughs> I heard uh, someone preaching on this, and I was amazed. They said, uh, well, they put it this way. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God simply came upon human beings. And in the New Testament, he operates from within the human being. Well, they just didn't read enough. Now, it is true that very often, particularly in the book of Judges, the phrase is used, and the Spirit of God came upon him. But I suppose there must be at least a dozen times when uh, the Old Testament said, and the Spirit of God was within him. Uh, and he being filled with the Spirit of God. Some of those, for instance, uh, those uh, the workers in the, in the tabernacle, they were said to be filled with the Spirit of God. And Joshua was said to be filled. The guy. He was a man in whom was the Spirit. Another place that he was filled with the Spirit. Uh, the one, uh, a verse that comes to my mind would be in Exodus about 34 or 35. Well, let's see. I think. Well, let's see. In uh, Exodus 35, verse 30, And Moses said unto the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of her of the tribe of Judah, and he hath filled him with the Spirit of God. Has filled him with the Spirit of God. Uh, now, then what is the difference? Well, of course, the Spirit of God today has an abiding presence within the beings of all saved people. And he empowered, filled or empowered individuals in the Old Testament for specific tasks. Uh, he has now made his home within the hearts of those who yield to him uh, with his abiding presence to bind us together. And this is the, this is the difference. It's not that he uh, is operative now and was non-operative then. So, uh, uh, he had a teaching ministry then as well as now, and he knew how to teach God's ways to men then. One of the verses that tells you that uh, the spiritual knew what the sacrifices were for, for is this right here. And you remember, David, was it the 50th Psalm he wrote? And he says, well, God doesn't drink the blood of bulls and such as that. Uh, let's see. Let's look for a moment. I shouldn't try to call these scriptures to mind that I just pulled out of the back of my head because I don't always know right offhand where they are. Of course, he says uh, in uh, Psalm 51, verse 16, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God. Uh, thou wilt not despise. In uh, Psalm 50, verse 7, Hear, O my people, I will speak, O Israel, I will testify against thee, I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices of burnt offering to have been continued before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house or he goat out of thy foes for every beast of the forest is mine, a cattle upon a thousand hills. 
I know all the fowls of the mountain and wild beast field are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you, for the world is mine and all the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. Well, Isaiah frequently brought out this same thing. Sacrifice without the... Uh, the spiritual insight is a perversion. It's to think that God can be mollified with our possessions. But every animal that was sacrificed in God's way looked forward to the sacrifice of Christ. And yes, the godly of the Old Testament knew this beginning with Eve. Uh, she knew that God had promised her that she would bear or be the mother of uh, a savior. Uh, let's look at some other other verses. Let's look a, a moment at uh, Galatians chapter three. In Galatians three eight. This is about Abraham. Look at 3, 6. Even as Abraham believed God, it's Galatians chapter 3, verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they who are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham, as the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Now, um, I know that the word gospel can be used in a broader sense. Good news. But this is the Apostle Paul that, this is the same Apostle Paul that defines the gospel for us. And certainly, uh, he's not changing uh, his, uh, his tune here. For instance, look at uh, Galatians 4, 13. He says, and you know how through infirmity of flesh I preached the gospel unto you at first. He's talking about that by which they were saved. He's talking about the gospel message. He defines this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says the gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel. And we're told here in the Galatians, Galatians 3 8 that the gospel was preached to Abraham. Why, that's how uh, he was perfectly able to take his, his son up to this mountain to, to uh, slay him because he already knew that God would raise him from the dead because he knew the gospel. And this is explained to you in Hebrews chapter 11. There's quite a, uh, a lengthy discussion there in that uh, chapter on faith, of Abraham's faith. He uh, he hadn't seen the promise yet. He'd lived in the promised land, but he, he still looked for the promise, it says. And then it says that he received his son Isaac in a figure, received him from the dead in a figure. Yes. Uh, they, the spiritual ones among them, understood what the gospel was in the Old Testament a sacrifice for us and uh, they were told God will send the sacrifice for you when they believed that and appropriated they were saved just like we're saved they believed God and it was counted unto them for righteousness or put to their credit and the only difference is the tense and really there's no difference in that because whatever God says he will do if you believe it well it's as though it were already done so it can be spoken in what is called in the Bible the prophetic past tense. Or the, yeah, the prophetic past tense. Besides, Peter uh, tells us that, uh, that these men uh, were told what they were preaching. He, they, they didn't understand some of the aspects of it. They didn't understand, for instance, that, that Christ would build the church. They didn't understand that. That was a mystery that Paul uh, unfolded. But they understood that God would send a per perfect sacrifice. They understood the gospel message, those of them 
who received it and were saved. There's a scripture back in Amos. In Amos uh, chapter 3. Amos 3, 7. It says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. That's by uh, the revealing power of the Holy Ghost. So, uh, Jesus says in John eight fifty six, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And we've already discussed this little phrase, I am. That's not good English, is it? Before Abraham was, I am. Except for one thing. That's a name of God. That's the I am that uh, Moses encountered in the third chapter of Exodus. He says, Who shall I tell them sent me? And Jehovah answered, You tell them, I am hath sent thee. And uh, Jesus says, I am that I am. And he is that I am. This uh, this little phrase is used 23 times in the Gospel of John. It actually doesn't even make good Greek. Uh, it's ego I me. Well, the word ego in Greek means I. And it can be used by itself, and it means I am. And the word I am means I am. So one's a pronoun and one's a verb. But in Greek, you can use uh, you can use the pronoun only, and the verb is implied. Or you can use the verb only, and the pronoun's implied. So it's using it's really saying I am am. Because the verb's twice, I am am. Uh, the uh, uh, for those of you that didn't happen to be here, you remember I brought this chart and I put four languages. The top one was yo soy, uh, which is I am in Spanish. And uh, we pointed out that you don't need the yo; you can use only the soy, and it's just as good a sense. Now, we can't do that in English. I can't go around saying, M. Don Kelso, M. Dem Kel- Don Kelso, or I can't say, I, I Don Kelso, I Don Kelso. See, i got to have both, don't I? I've got to say, I am Don Kelso. But in Spanish, you don't have to. You, I can say, I am Don Kelso, or I can just say, M. Don Kelso. Either one. I, uh, one is as correct as the other. I can't say, yo, without the soy. And then, uh, the same thing is generally true uh, the other next one I had was uh, EU, uh, EU, and then SOU. That's Portuguese. I'm going to learn some Portuguese. My Portuguese speaking son will be here in two weeks. Uh, now go out and beat the br- bushes and welcome him home. He'll be at home on Thanksgiving Day. Left for Portugal. Be three years is coming April. This is the first time back in the States since then. So, uh, make him show you how well he can speak his new language. But anyway, uh, in, um, in Portuguese, it's somewhat similar. I won't go into the difference. But in Greek, you can choose either way. It's ego I me. And you can, the pronoun serves for both or the verb. And we, we'll do this again when we get to where a chapter where they're both used right together. But when he says, before Abraham was, I am. They knew what he was saying. Now, if you don't think they knew what he was saying, look at verse 59. And took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them. Now, 
Look at chapter 10, verse 31 a moment. Or verse 30. See, he says, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Well, anytime you see them doing that, well, they're going to give you the, the reason. Um, in verse uh, 32, Jesus, we're in 1032. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Well, if somebody is, who's merely human claims to be God, they're supposed to be stoned. And that's why they picked up stones to stone him, because they wouldn't accept the fact that he was I am. And when he said, before Abraham was, I am, he was claiming to be God, and they knew it. And that's why they picked up stones to stone him. Now, uh, in the middle of this discussion between the Lord Jesus Christ in these Jewish adversaries, the Lord saw something that needed to be done. And he uh, performed a miracle uh, as recorded in chapter 9. And this uh, has some aspects about it that are somewhat difficult to, to explain. And uh, you might want to read it over before our lesson next time together and see if you can pick out some of these things. That, that There are quite a few things that happen here that you say, well, why is that? Why do you do that? Well, remember, the Gospel of John has very few miracles in it compared to the other Gospels. And it has only seven very carefully selected ones. And they're selected for a purpose. Uh, to give a spiritual uh, truth as well as is to show forth God's power. So, uh, see if we can come up with that. But, uh, I would like to impress upon you that uh, for those of you that might be more recent, David uh, has taught this Bible class. Uh, he used to be my favorite substitute uh, when I couldn't be here. And uh, I know he just would just be real anxious to see all the folks. And so if you know anybody that's been or that might have heard him, well, uh, tell him that, uh, tell them that David's going to be here uh, two weeks. Yeah, two weeks from tonight. And uh, he'll be uh, telling us his adventures and bring us in, bringing us a lesson from the Word. He, uh, right now, is teaching 11 Bible lessons a week in 11 different locations all over the country of Portugal. He just runs that little Pujo to death, getting from one to the other. He says the only time he has a minute to himself is when he's in the car going from one place to the other. <laughs> and uh, so... Uh, you want to hear some of what he's been telling them, well, I know you'll enjoy it. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you again for your word, and we pray that we would spend the amount of time in it that uh, its magnitude deserves. And we confess that uh, we have too many other things to do when we ought to be uh, seeking out your word and your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.